Rubbish. Uh, good morning. Welcome to all. So today our webinar is uh, conducted by the Mumbai Hematology Group as usual. And it, will, it is sponsored by NATCO Oncology. And the perfect square will take care of all the logistical supports of the meeting from the starting to the end. So I have special thanks to Mr. James Rajkumar and team NATCO. Mr. Yash, Mr. Kalpesh and the team Perfect Square, all executive committee members of the Mumbai Hematology Group. Today our guest speaker is Professor Joseph John Ludhiana. All our discussions who are themselves eminent hematologists or medical oncologists and you guys participants for sparing your Sunday morning. So Saturday, there will be one more lecture at 7 p.m. onwards. Reinventing the role of radiation in hematological malignancies. Think like a hematologist by Dr. Devaja. She's from International uh, Lymphoma Radiation Oncology Group, Houston, USA. There will be another lecture on the 12th June, next Sunday. Design thinking and innovation in healthcare. Time to give it a thought by Dr. Pranta Chakravarti from Calcutta. So today our guest speaker is Dr. M. Joseph John from Ludhiana. Dr. John is a clinical hepatologist, hematologist, and bone marrow transplant specialist in Christian Medical College, Ludhiana, Punjab. He did his MBBS and MD internal medicine from CMC Ludhiana itself. He did DM hematology from CMC Bellore. Subsequently, he has set up the hematology and stem cell transplant unit in CMC Ludhiana, Punjab. His department has a DM clinical hematology program since 2019. Currently, the center is a very active sibling and match unrelated donor transplant program for thalassemia and other hematological disorders. His other area of interest is hemophilia care, and he heads the comprehensive care center, which actively takes part in teaching and training of other hemophilia centers in Punjab. So topic is very interesting. Spreadsheet to bedside, unfolding cost-effectiveness studies for a clinician. Today's our discussions will be Dr. Akanksha Gar from Ahmedabad, Dr. Anil Singh from Indore, Dr. Cecil Ross from Bangalore, Dr. Dheeraj from Mumbai, Dr. Kripa Bajaj from Hyderabad, Dr. Lalit Mohan Sharma from Jaipur, Dr. Mukul Agarwal from New Delhi, Dr. Nilesh from Nasik, Dr. Sadashivadu from Hyderabad, Dr. Sandeep Shah from Ahmedabad, Dr. Satish Kumar from Bengaluru, Dr. Sailendra Prashad Bharma from Lucknow, Dr. Sujata Sharma from Mumbai, and Dr. Tulika Seth from New Delhi. Dr. Akanksha is the Assistant Professor, Department of Medical Oncology, Gujarat Cancer Center Institute, Research Institute, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Dr. Anir is a hematologist of CHL Hospital in Indore. Dr. Cecil Ross, Professor of Medicine, Head of Hematology Unit, St. John's Medical College Hospital, Bengaluru. Dr. Dheeraj is consulted in internal medicine and hematology, Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital and Research Center, Gurgaon, Mumbai. Dr. Kripa Bajaj, Consultant Medical Oncologist, Indo-American Cancer Center and Research in Hyderabad. Dr. Lalit Mohan Sharma, Senior Consultant Medical Oncologist, Sri Ram Cancer Center, Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Hospital, Jaipur. Dr. Mukul Agarwal, Assistant Professor, Department of Hematology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Nilesh Vasekar, Consultant Hematologist and BMT Physician of AC, ACG Manavata Hospital, Nasik. Dr. Sadashivadu Gundeti is a Department of Medical Oncology, Nijam Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. Dr. Sandeep Shah, Consultant Hematologist, Bone Marrow Transplanter from the Department of Medical Oncology, DCRI, and Vedanta Institute of Medical Sciences, Ahmedabad. Dr. Satish, Hematologist and Hematologist from Manipal Hospital, Jaswanpur, Bengaluru. Dr. Sainata Prashad Bharma, Associate Professor, Department of Clinical Hematology, King George Medical University, Lucknow. Dr. Sujata Sharma, Associate Professor, in charge of Division of Pediatrics, Hematology and BMT, Department of Pediatrics, Dr. Manatilak, Municipal Medical College and Hospital, Sion, Mumbai. Professor Tulika Seth, Department of Hematology, Auditor Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. 
Today our special guest will be Dr. Tufan Kanti Dalai. So Dr. Dalai is presently working as Professor, Head, Hematology Department, NRS Medical College and Hospital, Kolkata. He's an ex-alumni of Hematology Department, All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi, and he did DM Clinical Hematology from there. Published more than 100 papers in national and international journals, and over 150 publications in conference proceedings as abstract. He was organizing secretary of Hope Asia 2019, highlights of past European Hematology Association Congress, YedgeCon, BestCon, and several other national and international CME and other conferences. Editor of the Journal of Hematology and Allied Sciences, and reviewers of several national and international journals. So I request Dr. Tufan to please uh, share your words of wisdom to our young students and young consultants. Dr. Tufan, you can start. Thank you. Uh, good morning to uh, everybody. And thank you, uh, Dr. Subhapakas, for the kind word and introduction. And I really thanks to Mumbai Hematology Group and the Professor the Agarwal for giving the opportunity. You know, the hematology is basically a new super specialty. When we are doing the MBBS during that period of time, the people is little know about the subject of the hematology. And gradually the subject of the hematology is becomes advancing. And into the area of the before the 90s, there is nothing is there in the hematology. And over the years in the uh, first one and two decades, there is several advances in hematology. That's why the hematology is one of the lucrative subjects nowadays. Because if we consider the different aspects of the hematology, starting from the benign hematology, starting from the from the other part of this country, that hematology is very much the lucrative subject. And if you consider the curative potential of this, that different disease by doing the stem cell transplant, the hemophilia also become the important aspect that we can disable free life. Thalassemia, we can cure by doing the stem cell transplant. And also in the different diseases, like the acute leukemia, the AML and the ALL is there. Nowadays, it is the treatment is very lucrative. And the majority of the ALL patients, particularly in the children and the young adults, and they become normal life. Hodgkin's lymphoma is also the curative potential. And APML, in AML subtype, is become curative potential. So the hematology nowadays is becomes very advancing and one of the very advanced per specialty among the, all the discipline available. Day to day, there is a lot of the targeted therapy, the lot of the molecules has been developing that able to target the disease pathogenesis and able to cure our different hematological diseases. And ultimately the hematological patients is becomes going to be cured in the down the line. And present era of the hematology is very bright I must thanks to all the scientists and the researchers for focusing in the field of the hematology. So my message to the junior consultant and the student is that you please take the subject as a hematology as a career because the nowadays the hematology subject is very lucrative and they have a bright future in the hematology in the different hematological aspects. With this, thank you very much for the present here. I want to Dr. Swoprakas, please. Thank you, Tufan, for the excellent, uh, uh, your insights about the subjects, because we started career almost same time. Tufan is from Calcutta and I started from Mumbai. Uh, now, Dr. Joseph, now please go ahead with the presentation. Now, entire stage is yours. And it's an excellent topic and I really like, love to hear the topic. Just give me a minute. I'll, I'm just putting it on together. One second. Sorry for that <coughs> little delay. 
Thank you, Mumbai Hematology Group and Dr. Sanyal for this kind of introduction and this invitation and the introduction which you have given me. And uh, today the discussion is around a topic which we I used to kind of avoid in the past. I never really understood what it meant and I tried to understand it over a period of time and that's the result of this discussion. I coined the term spreadsheet to bedside because I realized that as the time coming by, we have to spend a lot of time on our spreadsheets trying to understand the data and also the analysis which comes out of that spreadsheet. The faster we learn that, the better it would be. So that's the picture there. And I said, okay, let's unfold the cost effectiveness from this spreadsheet. A disclaimer there, I am not claiming to be an expert in the field. The only claim to give this talk is my interest. And the choice of this topic is out of a keen desire to learn more while I prepared for this topic. And uh, just to recap, six, exactly six months ago on 5th of December, 2021, I gave a talk based on what Dr. Aya M.B. Agarwal had requested me. The job, topic of my choice was health economics primer for a hematologist. Just to do a recap, that time we discussed about, uh, so I want you to orient uh, yourself to the society perspective from what is there, what India can afford in comparison to the rest of the world, what an individual can afford in terms of treatment. So thought process, let me prime you on that before we continue with the discussion. So that's the GDP spent by different countries over the years. Canada is sitting at a top 18, 17%. UK, all of them are more than 6%. In India is a dismal 2% by the government and 2% by the individual. So out of pocket expenditure is actually more. It is not two and four, it is total is for somewhere around 1.6, 1.5 4 is the difference there. We all use a certain amount of comparison in the cost. For, for that matter, I would say uh, for every decision we make, uh, almost 90% of our decisions from morning to evening is, is thought on the basis of how much does it cost. Whether it is buying an equipment or setting up a laboratory, outsourcing the tests outside, treatment decisions between two drugs, or understanding the price was between two companies or budget allocation for a particular disease by the policymakers, or the pricing strategies from the company's perspective or the valuing and the pricing from both the, uh, the consumer and the provider. So from the Indian perspective, about 63% of our patients of the cost spent in the healthcare sector is from, suppose there are 100 rupees spent for the entire country for healthcare, 63 rupees comes from individual pockets. And this as compared to the rest of the country is very, very high. Most of the developed countries, that out of pocket is 10%, 15%, max 20%, 80% comes from elsewhere. So some of our patients actually fall into what we decide, uh, describe as catastrophic health expenditure, which means if somebody has the ability to pay 100 rupees and this expenditure is more than 40% of that 100 rupees, 40 rupees, then it is a catastrophic health expenditure. Suppose I earn 10,000 rupees a month, I have to spend 4,000 rupees on medicine, that is a catastrophic health expenditure. Or if I take my annual income, 1.2 lakhs of that 10,000 rupees, and I spend 40% of that, then also it is a catastrophic health expenditure. That means you are kind of distributing the cost across the years over 10%. And that can lead to impoverishment or indebtedness. Now that is what we must understand that some of our patients who undergo cancer therapy, and we may have cured them, or disease controlled them, but they may have gone to an indebtedness for the next 10 to 15 years or an impoverishment for something else is lost, the children's education, clothes, food, 
etc. are gone. So, makes poorer households poorer and drives non-poor household into poverty. That's the problem with these kind of catastrophic expenditures. So, the consequence of the expenditure is this. So, having a baseline understanding of that is very important in our decision making process. We also, this is a recap from the last uh, time when we discussed, we also talked about the value-based pricing of various uh, quality related pricing. Then we talked about competitive and comparative pricing. We talked about the GDC, GDP-based pricing, pay for performance. That was an interesting uh, phenomenon which happened with Kimria saying that if the patient gets well, then only pay us back. But you have to pay upfront. If the patient does not get well, we pay the money back. Of course, that may come uh, pay for performance for the doctors at point, then that will be a disaster, especially in hemat hematology if we have to do that. Uh, so price capping will be the issue for that. I mean, we talked about various parts of health economics. We touched upon various aspects of health and economics, the touch points for a hematologist. We also talked about pharmacoeconomics in terms of various regimens for a four months regimen. Are you willing to pay this much for a perceived advantage of X number of years? So I keep telling this to our residents and discussions. Myeloma treatment and all the other treatments are going to be like a menu. Menu card will be given to the patient this is the prop. This is the cost for four months. This is the outcome. This is the consequence or the expectations which you can get on. So choose based upon your affordability, and that's what we call willingness to pay. I come to that discussion as we discuss. We also talked about this thought bubble. We said, okay, if you had three crores, you have to spend it in the next few weeks. If you are given a choice to travel in Virgin Atlantic for three crores and live for one week, or you live in the hospital taking the treatment for 4.5 months at the same cost, which one would you choose? And there were some examples we talked about, certain myeloma therapy in that. At the end of it, we discuss, we understand that it is a trade-off. All decisions are a trade-off between opportunity, cost, and efficacy. So some we would gain, we lose some. There could be hard or surrogate endpoints, how we measure the gain or loss. And at the expense of actual finances, quality of life or opportunity cost. Opportunity cost, in other words, is the opportunity cost for watching this talk is the alternative you could have done in this period of time going out for a movie, going to a mall, going uh, whatever you want to do for hiking. That's the opportunity cost. Some of you have decided to stay back here because you felt there was a need and you could trade off for whatever other than that. So same thing happens, the opportunity cost of time or opportunity cost for money. When it comes to economic evaluation, we should understand, just understand. So some of the jargons which I may use may be going above your head, but keep concentrated as much as you can. But over a period of time, I think it is an important aspect. The language which we communicate with will include these terminologies. One is a cost benefit analysis. That means the efficacy is almost the same, kept it as everything is on monetary units. We want to buy a drug X and a Y. So basically you do this, suppose you want to choose between two generic molecules in the chemotherapy. It is a cost benefit analysis because the, the outcome of both is assumed to be the same because all of them are relating to the reference molecule. And now you're only looking at the cost differences. From the patient point's perspective, patient is looking at which is cheaper. So for the patient, that's the benefit. From the hospital's perspective, for the management perspective, they would choose between two companies based upon the MRP there and the uh, input cost, which means 
the, the, the cost at the purchase cost versus the sellable cost. And what's the mar margin there? So for the pharmacy perspective, for the hospital perspective, they're going to use which gives you the better margin as long as the efficacy is the same. From the patient's perspective, he's looking at what gives him a cheaper drug. So that's the selling price maximum retail price versus cost price differences there utilized as cost benefit analysis. When we say cost effectiveness analysis, we are looking at drug A versus drug B. Both have different cost and different efficacies. So drug A gives you a cost of 100 rupees with an efficacy of 10%. Drug B gives a cost of 200 rupees and efficacy of 15%. Am I willing to pay 100 rupees extra for that 5% advantage? That's the question we are asking in a cost efficacy analysis. Then there is something called a cost utility analysis because in the cost effectiveness analysis, I cannot compare between the cost allocation I have to do for a kidney transplant versus stem cell transplant because both cannot be compared from a policy maker point of view. If I have to make a policy maker point of view, I have to bring all of them under one denominator called quality. Quality adjusted life years. I'll come and delve upon that a bit later. The quality would give you then for each quality, how much does the cost for kidney transplant this and how much is the cost for liver transplant this or stem cell transplant. So three terminologies, we use them all the time, unknowingly without naming them. That's a difference which I talked about the cost effectiveness analysis. And ultimately what we call the word used is incremental cost effectiveness. That means for every one unit of increment of efficacy, how much is the cost? And based on that cost, I'm asking the question, are you willing to pay for it? So treatment A minus treatment B, that's a cost on the top. Effect A minus, so I took the example just now of 100 versus 200. So 200 minus 100, 100. And then efficacy, 10% and 15%, so 5%. So 100 by 5, 20. That is 20 rupees for every 1% increment in the efficacy. That could have been one aspect. Or life years added can be one year or 600 rupees, $600 per life year. That would be the other way to calculate that. And again, this is what we keep doing in the mind. And that is what has come in the graph. So this is called a cost effectiveness plane analysis. Don't get confused with the too many lines going here and there. On the x-axis is the efficacy. And on the y-axis is the cost. The cost goes up on the x-axis. That a north is always better. And to east, the efficacy increases. So anything in the northeast plane is high cost, highly efficacious. Anything in the southeast plane is better efficacious and less cheaper. So this is the actual advantage you are getting. Cheaper and best. Cheap and best is the word we use here. There is no doubt, something is cheaper and better. Why do you want to stick to the other? So use for cheap and best. Costly and worse, Northwest, do not even reach there. Now we have a problem with these two, Northeast and Southwest, because in the Northeast, let me take a pointer that is easier than. Okay, so when we say Northeast, that is more costly, more efficacious. This is less costly, less efficacious. That's where we need to make our uh, decision-making process subsequently. So this advantage of 
cost and quality will help us to decide on the allocative efficiency, especially from the management perspective. You want to start five departments. Which one would you give the priority? Whichever department is giving you the cost over the quality, it gives you. So from the management perspective, which department gives you the maximum profit per unit of money invested? I want to invest 100 rupees. And if I have to get for 100 rupees, I can make so much of money. That's the advantage for an administrative point of view, you would say. A similar thought process is that. That's a return on investment, what you're talking about in money part of it, returns on investment. So cost per quality is a similar analogy, I would say, for the cost you spend and what's the quality I get. And therefore, you can compare between the oranges and apples rather than all the oranges together or the apples together. Okay, so let's say this is a good example I saw from another uh, video which I saw. Suppose you have to buy a television, right? And the television costs say 10,000 bucks, 20,000 bucks. Now, as per the inch improves, the cost also goes up and that's a linear increase there. As you see, that's the screen size and that's the price going up. So you're willing to pay 100 rupees extra for 10 inches of screen and your efficacy ratio is $10 per inch. So 10% or 10 life years, uh, 10 rupees or 10 cost, so much of cost per quality. This is the quality. This is the cost of the therapy over the others. Now here, suddenly you are able to say and understand I'm ready to pay 100 rupees, $100 extra for that 10 inch additional. Uh, 10, uh, one inch additional, 10 rupees, $10 I'm ready to pay. However, if the cost increase was skewed, and if you were to suddenly pay $90 for that one extra inch, you would rather take a smaller team, right? Now you realize that there is something called a comparator coming in our minds before we make that decision. And that is exactly what we call an incremental cost effectiveness ratio switch. If this was the terminology which was used, a 15 suddenly becomes as cheap as the 30 inch. You would rather take it as cheap and best. It becomes a dominant this thing. So that the, this part of dominant was in the southeast region on the right Dover down. Efficacy was increasing. Cost is decreasing. Therefore, I would rather take a 50 inch TV. This is cheap and best. That is, I'm getting for the same cost, I'm getting a 50 inch and therefore I would go for that. So incremental cost is like this. 30 inch cost $300, 39 was 310. 40 was 400, but 50 was only 300. I would rather use this. This is a dominant strategy. So where is, depending upon the strategies, that was an example to show, to drive home the point. In other words, we are all looking for more bang for the buck. Same thing in terms of the patient's perspective or the government patient's perspective. We want to minimize our expenditure and maximize our outputs. Now, on one side, we are all seeing the evidence-based medicine, but evidence-based medicine itself is not a decision-making tool because you know this is better. It is better for, say, letromovir is fantastic to give as uh, prophylaxis in CMV, but getting the letromovir is it a reasonable option. Evidence says give letromovir for CMV prophylaxis for high-risk patients, but I cannot do that because I am taking into various other considerations before I can use this. Um, various other drugs are there which has been used. So if evidence says that giving amphotericin prophylaxis may be better, I'm just giving an example that defibrotide, for example, VOD. Evidence says that giving defibrotide is fantastic to reduce VOD. But from our perspective, it is not a convenient thing. It is not a cost-effective thing because it is tremendously expensive. So even though there is evidence, we may ignore it because I may not be able to decide and implement it. So now the new concept of evidence to decision concept, you ask the question, what is the perspective taken? 
and then you make a background of it, you assess the benefit and the harms, you prioritize. This prioritization is essentially possible if you have the tools for cost effectiveness in your, ha in your, in your, in your hand. And then of course you make a summary decision, you make a leak table in your mind, and then you say, okay, this is a better off decision based on these, these, these conditions. So that's a chart. If somebody is interested, the McMaster University from great recommendations is now coming up with these kind of uh, decision-making processes to grade recommendations as well from the evidence and prioritizing and recommending based on values, preferences, acceptability, feasibility. And of course, this is where the balancing of damages and the benefits have come from and then using the resources for equity and cost effectiveness. Equity is a terminology which we used. We discussed last time that uh, based upon the, because the baseline is not the same for everybody, you have to equate somebody who is less capable or less advantages and you have to make them in the same plane. <coughs> Before the... So to take this entire cost effectiveness discussion forward, I want you to focus your minds into thalassemia transplant and thalassemia treatment and transplant so that I can give you an example, a step-by-step example for cost effectiveness interpretation of the papers. There are various questions coming to say, take the word transplant and thalassemia. We can have at least a thousand questions in our heart or in our mind. What is the role of stem cell transplantation? How many transplants are done for thalassemia major so far? Is aloe is better or transfusion chelation is better in terms of overall survival? Or should I use triosulfan based considering the conditioning or busulfan related conditioning, uh, based conditioning? Is related transplant better or unrelated better in terms of OS and TFS? Are sibling transplant better than non-sibling? Would giving ATG in conditioning regimen reduce the incidence of severe GBHD? Does triosulfan nullify the pressure of classification thal transplant? And these questions can go on and on. And you know, you can skim through that mismatch, matched, mud, uh, non-mud, haplo, etc. Not all, but some of them are linked to cost. And therefore, when it is linked to cost and it is not a dominant strategy. Dominant strategy, I said, cheap and best. Less cost, more outcome. No doubt. More cost, less outcome, throw them. Decision is easy. We are only grappling with poorer outcome, lesser cost. Better outcome, better cost. That's where we need to deal. Poorer outcome, lesser cost is a problem of only of developing countries. It's a problem of developed and everybody else's problem is more cost, much better outcome. That's where the debate of cost effectiveness come in play. So let's ask the question yourself. We are only looking at the role of stem cell transplantation in thalassemia and let us walk our way through to decide which strategy should I decide for treating thalassemia patients. So I look at the literature and I find that hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, there is a paper by Angelucci in 2010 saying that 30 years transplants have been done and there the number of transplants done over the last many years are increasing and there's a good number coming in and the outcome is 73% thalassemia free survival. Good, you can get rid of thalassemia, transfusion independent uh, and the survival is 73%. But a question come in my mind immediately. Is it 73% more than transfusion chelated patients? If I could transfuse and chelate them and get a 90% survival at 20 years, wouldn't that be better except that I have to transfuse and chelate and that could have offset with the cost of the transplant anyway. That paper also mentioned about different age groups, but however, it has not compared it with transfusion chelators. So that's a question comes in your mind. Should I continue transfusion chelation or should I transplant? I know understanding that, okay, cure is there in thalassemia. Fantastic, good. I can get rid of the stigma of having thalassemia, of having gone to the hospital for once a month. But what if 
I die. If I if the patient dies and 20% of the patients or 10 to 20% of the patients may die, wouldn't that then offset the advantages the transplant gave? Suppose I'm in that bad group. How do I decide that? And then you look at the data and say, okay, is there anybody compared long-term survival of thalassemia major with transplant and survival with conventional treatment? And that would be a long-term data, maybe a retrospective data from a registry would be the fantastic thing. So that itself was done. They did a retrospective study from EDMT registry on a 10-year probability. Overall survival was 88% and thalassemia free survival was 81% in the transplanted group. Fantastic. We, we critically appraise that journal and say, okay, this Journal of Hematology, Journal of American Journal of Hematology, the good impact factor, 127 centers worldwide. It's a retrospective study and it's a cohort one is to one transplanted to non-transplant. Even though there were about a thousand patients, they could get only 250 patients in each group. They were matched for age and sex almost like a propensity score matching that it can be done in SPSs. No intervention here, it was only an observational study. Over 29 years, the study period, and it is a descript, it is an analytical study because you're comparing between group, two groups and taking the inference. The outcome measures were overall survival and trans, uh, trans, uh, thalassemia free survival. And if it is analytic, they used a comparison with log rank and the effect size were measured, should have been measured by Hazard. They did a quasi-experimental design because it was not a prospective experimental randomized study to two groups. They looked back and did a matching between the age and the sex. And they found, I mean, that is to reduce the confounders as much as possible in the selection process. And they showed that none of them changed in the, between the transplanted and the conventionally treated groups, nothing changed and the p-value was not significant across the group. Except for the cardiovascular complications were more in conventionally treated group. That is the same characteristic. The baseline characteristics were not different. That's the point coming to that. And in the transplanted group, they were sibling and unrelated and they were doing a separate analysis between among the transplanted groups. But here the question we are asking, first question as to the title is comparison between transplant versus conventionally treated group. So it shows that the overall survival of the conventionally treated is 85%. Overall survival of the conventionally transplanted patients is 82%. And thalassemia free survival was only 77%, which means I could lose 5% of the patient, even if I had done a transplant, 5% of them lost the graft. They relapsed. And it is now essentially a 77% versus 85. Even though the p-value was not significant, in your mind, you're saying, okay, there is an inclination towards this. Am I in the right track? What is the outcome there? Is it worth, was it worth the money which I spent for the transplant as compared to overall uh, transfusion chelation? Those are the questions which will come out when you know that you are comparing between these two. How do I say, is it a cost-effective thing to do a transplant or not? So allogenic transplantation has high immediate cost in early mortality. Therefore, as policymakers, we must decide where to spend the money. And one of the questions, we need to answer this question because we have to go to the policymakers and say, look, instead of spending 1.5 lakhs every year for a transfusion chelation patient through the government funding, it is better to spend 10 lakhs or 15 lakhs now and take them through for 20, 30 years rather than spending 1.5 lakhs at year for the next 20, 30 years. But of course, somebody, the counter argument would be, uh, you know, the, the, the net present value of this is very high and the perceived, uh, the, the inflation rate will be there. And therefore the cost of transplant now, if I spend 25 lakhs, 10 years from now, it is X, Y, Z. I could have invested that money and I could have 
you know, supported them through all that questions will come to put to rest of all those uh, discussions is the only way by using a cost effectiveness as of now. Just to give you a perspective of the money. If you had 10 lakhs in 2000 and this study, I mean, this analysis which I did in 2019, if you had spent 2000, I mean, in 2000, if you had 10 lakhs rupees invested in the bank and the interest rates were as per the inflation of the country, it would have been 32 lakhs. This means in 20 years, it became three times the cost, the, the value of the money or it reduced. On the other hand, if you look at it this way, if the transplant costed in 20 years ago, transplant costed us 10 lakhs. Even now it is 10 lakhs. It should have been 32 lakhs per sibling transplant if the inflation had continued. That means the transplant costs have come down significantly. And you can look at this diagram and use the reverse of the same diagram. And you would say that cost of transplant has actually become one third from 20 years or it become half in the last 10 years. Thanks to the pharma companies who have brought out the various conditioning regimens, uh, the molecules which have come in the generic molecules and some of the supportive care which has improved with less, lesser cost. So now comes the, the, the crux of the discussion here to cost effectiveness analysis. It can be done as part of a clinical trial as because you're doing a clinical trial, you can take the cost across and then compare both in the end, like the randomized group are compared, or you can do it as a separate study only for cost effectiveness, looking backwards and you know reviewing the data. Who needs it? The first person who would require is the government because the government has to decide we have only 60,000 crores left with us every year in the budget towards healthcare. Uh, not towards healthcare, uh, towards healthcare. And therefore, how much do I use? That is 1.5% of the entire budget of the country. Uh, how much do I use for X disease? For the insurance perspective, they would also say that treatment you chose was cost effective or not from the reimbursement perspective. Therefore, if you're not using a cost effective treatment, I'm not going to reimburse. This is going to come back in the insurance perspective. Suppose you say you had an Hodgkin's disease, you could have given ABVD, but I chose to give an intensive uh, therapy, uh, BA EPOC or EPOC therapy or whatever I wanted to give and it cost us 10 times the cost. So far, they're not looking at it, but of course, they, that is what is going to happen in the future in terms of the decision makers of the healthcare providers are going to say, for that 1% or 5% advantage over the ABVD, would it, was it worth spending that additional eight, eight lakhs rupees or not? Clinicians can decide based upon the choice of treatment and if you understand it. And of course the patient himself because 63% of the stakes are with the patient in terms of the payment is concerned. When, what are we comparing here? When you have a new drug coming into the market or a new intervention which is coming into the market, you can compare two drugs or not or a new drug with a reference uh, drug which we have. So these are the two things. So for example, if you want to compare with the transplantation, of course you cannot randomize into transfusion chelation group and the transplant group because then, then it becomes a genetic randomization if you had the option of transplanting whoever had a sibling match. Otherwise, you are only looking at the data of the past trying to understand the cost incurred in each of these groups and then compare the outcome based on your own results. What do we measure in these cost-effective analysis? One, of course, the efficacy has to be there. Then an even larger exercise would be to evaluate and account for or collect all the direct and the 
indirect cost and there is something called an induced cost. Induced cost is something which you have a downstream cost because of what you had given and that was not directly linked to it but indirectly something got avoided and therefore it is an induced cost. Say a vaccination in transplant, post-transplant vaccination. You did the transplant, the direct cost of it comes under a part of a direct cost though, direct cost of healthcare transplant, uh, of a transplant and uh, indirect, I mean, and that's that induced a cost for vaccinating them and therefore it will be taken under the cost which is incurred or a cost by the transplant. And an indirect cost for traveling to and fro from the hospital or an informal care for unemployment, etc. There is also, a, we are also then measuring the efficacy there. Efficacy with regarding to life years. How many years extra have they lived? Or what percentage had a five year survival better than the other? And also a new a concept which we must understand is the quality adjusted life year. I'll come to that. How do I say about the excess years added had a quality similar to a normal human being or it was a substandard or a suboptimal one? In other words, I can increase the life years on the bed by 10 years and a quality of life which is very poor on the bed or I can increase the life's expectancy of five and make him like a normal man. Which one would I choose as the questions? It's drawing back to the analogy of you got three crores. Would you rather be at home for four and a half years or in the hospital for four and a half months taking the medicine or you can get one injection and go see the world in one week and die? That's where you and me would say and choose the quality we would attribute to that state of living. So that's the quality of life. Right now, international standards is a euro call, which is the in thing now. There are various other quality of life measured statements, I mean, measured uh, instruments are there. And it is used by multiplying the weights. So that will ultimately tell you what is the utility weight zero to one. One is in the perfect health and zero is death. And today as a hematologist, what is the quality of life you are maintaining or utility is there if you were not a hematologist or in a normal human being? Is it one or is it 0.5 is the question. And how many years you want to spend in this particular state you are in? I asked this question to my residents in between. What do, what do you call a quality of life of a residency program? And uh, nobody, everybody has only smiled. Nobody wanted to say it is poor. So just to give an analogy of two different studies. Okay. So study number one, if you take both this study, the patient lived for six years. And this study, the patient lived for seven years. And on one side, the utility, the word is utility. Okay. How much is my utility today? Is it number one, top of the world? Okay. Or is it 0.5, very low? You can ask this question to the patient. Okay. You go into the room and say, okay, how do you rate yourself if you are normal 10 on a score of 10? What are you today? And they'll say eight. And that means 0.8 is a utility. Right. Or uh, in compared to normal uh, working life is one, what do you label yourself to be? That is 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So even though this patient has lived only for six years, the quality is 4.7 is the point. Now I'll tell you how it came up to. And so even though he has lived longer, he had a poorer quality in terms of utility. So this has come from this various things. So this first year, I'm assuming this is 0 0.6 here and point 1 into 0 0.6 plus this 1 to 2 is another 1, 1 into 0 0.8 and again 1 into 0 0.8, 1 into 0 0.8, then say 1 into 0 0.6 here 
and then 1 into 0.1. So that you calculate, it's not the exact, I just put it across from the paper. Uh, would we give it about for 4.7? And that's exactly what is happening in the quality evaluation. There are different softwares which you can do, but mostly it can be done on a software called Tree, R, or even the Excel sheet. If you know the formulae, how to put in and link the formulae across the Google Sheets. So that's, that's why I said all of these discussions and evaluations ultimately point towards the spreadsheet, which we need to handle on a daily basis. So that's the ISR, incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Mm -hmm. Keep this one word in your mind. After the entire hematology discussion, I tell my residents generally, that MBBS students, if you know how to interpret a thalassemia minor from a CBC, that's good enough. At the end of this lecture, if the ICER word has been imprinted in your mind, that is good enough. Uh, the rest you will build around it. So that's the ICER when the cost and the effectiveness are combined. In the case, the additional cost, I kept saying that, what is the additional cost required to gain that one quality? That's the question we're asking. In the hemophilia patient, I'm asking the question, what is the additional cost I require to reduce that one additional knee bleed? How much does it cost to the institution or cost to the government? So there are different cost effectiveness analysis which you can do. One is on a model-based analysis. The second is a trial-based analysis, as I just mentioned. In a clinical trial, both the randomized control groups, both the costs are being collected along the way. And in the end, you do a difference between the efficacy and the cost. Or you can do a hybrid. I'm doing a trial. I will take some of the data from this. And then I will do historical data to compare the rest of the things. And I'll give a lifetime uh, time horizon. So in a model based, suppose we say, I want to do a study on thalassemia or any disease condition for that matter, say rheumatoid arthritis. One is only physiotherapy and one is NSAID I want to do. And I want to do a cost effectiveness analysis on both these groups, uh, or it can be a surgical intervention, whatever it is, two things are there. And I'm going to say that, okay, if I do this, these are the potential states in which this patient can be. That's an important concept. I give this treatment. I follow up the patient. He commits suicide is one particular direction you can take. I have to re-attempt in this patient the medicine. This is for a drug for psychology drug. Or it is an initial state. It has gone to his death. So everybody, everything actually leads to death ultimately. And these are the states in which the patient exists. And we would know when you do this treatment, what are the probabilities that he may come back for follow-up? That is based upon your previous studies or your previous, uh, previous observational studies, retrospective studies in your own institution. So that is called a Markov model, different states in which you can be. Say, so for example, I take the entrance exam and I can be in a state where I got into MBBS. After the MBBS, I have to work for two more years before I get into a post-graduation. There is a 50% chance I can get into a post-graduation. If I get into a post-graduation, there again, a 50% chance that I can get into a post-subspeciality. Or I can continue in this state or I would change my profession to something else and what's the probability of those associated with that. That's called a Markov modeling of various states in which you are in. And this then is combined with various data from the trials, the observation studies. I'll, come, I'll give a flavor of that in the discussions, ensuing discussions. None of them is 100%. Nobody can say that that number from one that study is good. Everything will have a confident, confidence interval 
which will vary the probability. Suppose I say there is a 50% chance that I can get into a entrance exam. The confidence interval will be based upon my past performance. There is a 30% to 70% chance that I can get it. And when we take that possibilities or what it can vary from is what we call a sensitivity analysis. Then each of this in, a, I mean, don't get confused by seeing the diagram and the name there. We need to do something called a Monte Carlo simulation. So that means it's an iterative process of remove one, put it back, remove another one, put it back kind of a situation. Run it various times. It's called bootstrapping. In other words, if you are inclined towards statistics. And then you bring out what is the median so that a thousand times it is repeated by putting it back and every time it won't return the same value. It will vary from one uncertainty to the other uncertainty. And between that, you get a line, and that is the median line which we take. Okay, so that's talking about what to do with these numbers which came out of your out of the spreadsheet. Even if you do not understand or register these terminologies on Markov and this thing, understand ISIL. What's the ISIL for this? What's the ISIL for that? Based on that, we make a decision. It's a trial-based model, as I said. Either you can sit down and search the literature and do. A trial-based is you are doing one prospective study. Trial is being done. And you compare the cost and the consequences between the arms. Or you do a hybrid approach. This is a fantastic opportunity because this is where you can do yourself based upon our own data and then do a literature review, plug in the numbers which you do not have and then make it in a lifetime horizon. So the word we need to know is the lifetime horizon an analysis. And also any of the numbers which we take in the cost, there is a word called discounting. Discounting is a word used for looking at the cost. It's like the uh, inflation cost, which is accounted for. And it's a 3% reduction based on the numbers in the iterative processes. So how do we interpret this? You are reading now an article. I'll walk you through another article for us to understand that better. We need to understand how this paper has been done. Was it a society perspective or a healthcare perspective? What's the difference there? Societal perspective is the government is make the decision maker there. There, you would look at the direct and the indirect costs, which means if I have to take a direct and indirect healthcare cost, I would say the patient will come for an admission for transplant. The caregiver is also losing his time and money for the transplant process. How much is the loss happened to the caregiver also? How much is a loss happened to the patient for which he cannot go for work during that period? How much of extra work has been induced? That is the foolproof social perspective. Please understand that. Most of the studies currently published, even though they say the societal perspective, they may not be 100% sure or 100% coverage. It's not an exhaustive thing. It's not an easy thing to do. Therefore, it is not done. But you must understand the frame. From the healthcare perspective, from the hospital point of view, it is basically the costs incurred. It is not a lifetime cost. It is, we, you, there are a few papers in, the, in, 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 in India where the cost of transplant, the cost is different. The cost of care, cost of transplant is different from cost effectiveness analysis and the perspective is different there. Then comes the cost effectiveness plane. So the second point after the ICER, if you can remember this plane, that makes life much easier. I want to concentrate this piece here. We talked about this a little before. This is the effect on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have the cause. In the dominant decision maker, the cause are less, effect is better. 
no question best choice cheap and best okay whereas this is costly and worse easily rejected rejected immediately on the d this is less effective less costly better from the financial perspective it is like i would rather use chlorambucil in cll i know it is not going to give you a cure or uh, crs but who cares the patient cannot afford ibrutinib now i would rather give chlorambucil he is in an icer which is on the uh, this is uh, the uh, the southwest zone which is the cost is less effect is less ibrutinib it will come into this group more expensive more efficacious than its comparator chlorambucil how better efficacious is the question in a you know you know if i have to say a ballpark figure the chlorambucil will give you 5% cr rates ibrutinib may give you about 80% cr rates the cost of ibrutinib is 30000 a month chlorambucil is 1000 a month am i willing to pay 29000 for the 80% advantage so it is 29000 divided by 80 that is um, for each percentage advantage i am getting i am ready to pay almost uh, 4000 400 4, 400 400 so that's that's the point at that inflection point in which you make that call then comes you have understood that okay one particular treatment per colly will cost us 1 lakh rupees so what is that better or worse now that's a question which we have to ask who is the payer how much am i willing to pay for example a very wealthy man is ready to pay even 1 crore for a one additional day in his life for a laborer to spend 1 lakh for 10 months is not good enough so that's the point some of it exists in our mind and the convention in which we live in will determine that so when we say a threshold if it is a tax payers money the government decides for example that is a willingness to pay based on the ability to afford the ability to pay and willingness to pay if i am unable to pay there is no question of willingness to pay i have 1 lakh rupees in my pocket then only i can think of giving 50000 if i have only 10000 with me i can't think of giving 50000 so that's the cost effectiveness threshold so give you a flavor of that decision making buckets in the us it is about 50000 us dollars per quarter so the government and the various bodies in fact there is various bodies they decide the disease board this is uh, related bodies which decides what is good or bad and then the convention happens across the healthcare payers insurance companies same thing with uk nice they have put 20000 pounds per call much half than us dutch council they said okay anything between 10000 to 80000 if the 80000 is bad it, it is a worst off and that's what here the us uk says anything more than 2 20000 we will take it to the advisory board and then make a decision based upon various other actions in india when you do not have a body to say that we generally go by 1 gdp per capita our 1 gdp per capita is about 2000 so about 1.2 lakhs per quarter if is the cost then we would say that we are better off and the day treatment decision is good but you know who said who said gdp per capita one time is better off one to two time one to three times is intermediate and more than three times is bad that's what the convention is that is roughly based upon 
what can be a what can we afford to pay out for example we have an ECHS patient on a ventilator not able to come out if the pay family were to pay from their own pocket they would not have continued but because somebody else is paying they are ready to take him off the ventilator or take him home when the doctors know that the probability of survival is less than 1% or 5% that is the point at which we can probably consider some thresholds. Is it worth to continue or not? So that's an objective way of uh, telling the public on bringing evidence to the process. I touched upon the word sensitivity analysis based upon the uncertainty. You know, in medicine, we always talk about uncertainty than certainty. And the confidence interval, which we talk about, is more of the non confidence interval, actually speaking. It is the uncertainty interval. It is the interval of uncertainty. Uh, when I put 95% confidence in it, that is the interval of my uncertainty. That's the way you must look at it. 95% confidence I have, 5% I do not have confidence, and the 5% confidence do not, I do not have is because of the uncertainty which lies between this value to that value. Similarly, it is sensitive analysis done in the economic analysis. One is the univariable analysis and one is the probabilistic sensitivity analysis. Univariable analysis is taking one parameter at a time and taking the uncertainty values and running it through the Monte Carlo analysis and iterative process there. Probabilistic is when all the variables are basketed into one and you get a graph. We wouldn't delve into too much into it. It may be a little confusing, but if you can remember ICER, cost effectiveness plane, and here the word sensitivity exists, the word willingness to pay, good enough. So that's a cost effectiveness acceptability curve so to speak, is a derivation from the willingness to pay concept. So what this graph shows is that you have the quality, euros per quality, so how much money is spent, and that is a probability of being cost effective based upon the threshold of the company, this thing. So in this, if this is the threshold at which I will take, 92% willingness to pay would be there for the probability I have to take up that. Let's not jump into that too much, but it is an acceptability curve. Taking you two papers across. This is a study on reduced intensity conditioning transplant versus transfusion chelation in Thailand. The setting is Thailand. By courts, if you have to take the population is the thalassemia patients. The intervention is the transplant. The comparator is the transfusion chelation. Time frame we would see in the study a few years in their concept. And the setting is in Thailand in a center where they do transplants. They made a Markov model. We won't go into that. So that's a thalassemia patient without, with the cardiac compress. So this is the severe thalassemia patient. They can take two routes. One is a reduced intensity transplant route if they have a match, or they go into a transfusion chelation route. And this is the transfusion chelation route of a patient with, if the patient has Okay, so there are two starting points here. One is the transfusion chelation state and the transplant group. A transfusion chelation state can go into a transplant route or it can go to different states, Q1 to onwards it is mentioned. And that is subsequent states like they can have hepatitis C infection, they can get heads. Hep B infection, they can get uh, cardiac complications, they can get iron related, iron diabetes mellitus. All the possible routes in which a transfusion chelation patient taken can route, go through, pass through, and they account for all the states in which the transplant patient can go through. 
which is he can go into a death post transplant. He can go into acute GVHD. He can go into chronic GVHD a few years down the line. For each of this, they need to assess, accept a probability figure. For example, this is a clinical variable. The Q1 state is death. Q2 state is they can go back to a blood transfusion and uh, triangulation. They can go to a death from there. And each of these probabilities have to be accepted collected and the cost which is required for pre-BMT, BMT and each of these states have to be collected. This is for transmission chelation group. What are the clinical transitional probability and what is the cost for each of those states? And then we will see what is the efficacy of those based upon the previous study or a survey done or an expert opinion taken. These are the ways in which you can get those numbers. Univariable analysis done for the sensitivity analysis. And here what it shows is that in the cardiology patients, uh, uh, the, the cost of the patients with cardiologic complications are worse off than the others. So patients with cardiological cardiac complications in a transfusion chelation will end up spending a lot of money also. So, that then adds to the cost incurred in the transfusion chelation group. That's the interpretation of this willingness to pay curve, there are uh, the acceptability curve. When the US dollar is 4,200 4, expenditure, 71% of the patients can have a probability to have a cost effectiveness uh, attributed to. Their utility data collected was based upon their version of SF36B2. This is a quality of life capturing questionnaire tool. They can accept that. And based on that, they attribute a utility number to that. And that is calculated based upon five parameters, which is scored from one to five. Recently, we have collected this data in the country. It got published this year. And for each of the health states, there is a value associated to that. And therefore, there is a validation done in the country because the quality of life perception in India and the US are different. This is a study which we did from our center. The aims again, it's a similar study which what you saw in Thailand. That is the different states in which the transfusion chelation patient can go into various states. And we attributed various percentages to that. And that's the states from which the transplant patient can transition from first year of transplant. He can have a GVHD. He can have a rejection in the first year itself, or he can die. If he has a rejection, he goes back to transfusion chelation. So what percentage of them go into transfusion chelation? What is the cost incurred after that also is taken into consideration in the transplant group? and second years and following years. So those then gets reiterated, iterated and that. So in our study, it showed that the ICER with transplant as compared to transfusion chelation was 64,000 rupees in case of match related donor and 1,67,000 in case of match unrelated donor transplant, which means this is half of our per capita GDP. This is more than one per capita GDP. The probability of MRD transplant was cost effective at the willingness to pay threshold of this much rupees was 94%. So that's the terminologies which we use. So in the MRD, it showed that as long as the cost is, if the cost of the G, the G, ICER quality is less than one GDP, it is cost saving. One to three. GDP, it is cost effective, and otherwise it is cost ineffective. Matched unrelated donor transplant was cost effective and more cost. If it is costing more than 22 lakhs, it was not cost effective was the analysis which is shown in a mud transplant because the cost incurred is high. That is why the government of India was not supporting too much of mud initially, even through Call India, but now they have started because the results are getting better. When the results get better, 
the cost effectiveness ICER improves. That means the cost per quality comes down. That probability was 94%. And the conclusion was it is highly cost saving. Okay, so a lot of uh, technology, I mean, technical words I have used, somebody with a background, it is better probably. Uh, the way we in, the way one should evaluate any cost effectiveness study is through what we call a cheers checklist. You can easily get this from Equator website. All the studies which you have to evaluate, what is a checklist is given there. And in that, when we are evaluating a economic analysis, there is an abstract in that uh, whatever the structured summary has to be given. Essentially, the components of what I mentioned has to be there. And what generally happens is that many of this is not followed and still it gets published uh, because of the lack of knowledge and understanding in this. And people use the word cost effectiveness and cost utility and cost benefit interchangeably. And I hope you would have got a slightly orientation towards the differences. It was tough for me also to initially to understand this, but because of the sheer need, I'm trying to understand it, long way to go to understand it better and actually make it to the bedside. And each of those checklists also talk about the price, the conversion, the rationale of description, what model you used, what is the time horizon you use, and of course, most important, from which perspective is the study starting? That's a starting point which we must understand. Is a healthcare perspective or a societal perspective? If it is a societal perspective, we use all the possible costs. If it is healthcare perspective, it is from the cost to the hospital only. So I wouldn't go through each line, but that is available freely in the web. The take home points for you. Our co any cost effectiveness study is about choices. And they are about the margins and how much is the difference there? How much are we willing to pay? But how much extra you are willing to pay is a question. One is you're willing to pay some amount. How much extra am I willing to pay? It's like decision making between uh, third AC versus uh, second class AC, if you want to book. I'm now thinking it is a three tire, I need to be there, or versus a two tire, and I have to pay. Am I willing to pay for that extra to go in the flight and reach there in less time hours? So that's the willingness to pay for that extra time saved in my travel. Uh, the quality of life matters with regard to so the quality of time saved and the quality the time spent with the family while you take the air and not the train matters and the, how much are you attributing that for qualities that's called the utility value and who is willing to pay is the question and if it is your out of pocket expenditure you would have done this cost effectiveness in your mind anyway and all of us do the cost effectiveness and cost utility on a daily basis whether you want to eat an ice cream today or later, or I want to use a, you know, dood peda now or now later, or how much is a calorie I must take. All of this is a comparative process I'm taking the cost effectiveness across. And I think I've talked enough It is time for lunch. And that time may be more effective on the lunch than, than the cost effectiveness studies. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. And I'll take some questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, for a lovely presentation and uh, excellent overview. It's a very, uh, very difficult topic, I guess. And you, and I've seen your CV that you are an MBA also. I think very few hematologists and medical oncologists having an MBA degree in the country. So I really appreciate the talk. Uh, I, have, I just start the question session like this. Uh, you need some rest for one or two minutes? Or no, no, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, so you use a very fantastic word about the myeloma stuff. There's a menu of myeloma treatment of eight course uh, lunch or dinner, whatever. <laughs> I, I really like that thing. So, so what is your advice to us? Uh, what, what do you feel in your practice when you talk with the patient about this? Uh, in honestly speaking, when you used to counsel in KM, no, I still remember 
uh, in aplastic anemia we tell there are three type of biryani veg biryani chicken biryani mutton biryani so one is the transplant one is the atg cyclosporin one is the cyclosporin alone choose whatever you want depending on your pocket that is the way you used to tell so when you talk about the myeloma transplant uh, sorry myeloma treatment uh, uh, algorithm to the patient and when their money is tied you understand but how you go about how you talk about the finances part you, you discuss the each treatment finances part in detail or what you do actually in practice so you know all of us can have various strategies for that based upon the time and the literacy of that individual in front of you and what is your assumption of his affordability so i wouldn't of course discuss direct tumor for a laborer if i have to come across that but if i know that he's got an affordability is there somebody else is paying and he is the guy who may want and i would say okay are you willing to pay 25 lakhs versus for first year uh versus uh, going ahead and doing the rest of it so of course we are in the process of making a menu card dr ketan must be listening to this talk and we've been discussing about that to come up with the actual numbers based upon the references and say that if you do dara vcd or dara vd this is going to be the cost in the first four months and this is the outcome and it is very extremely difficult for us to make a decision for them so right now we don't have a menu card but we write so for atg a plastic anemia of course we have a menu card in the situation you can say uh, transplant 70% uh, outcome with the 10 to 12 lakhs cost uh, atg cyclosporin 50 40 to 50% chances of outcome with the 6 to 10 lakhs cost cyclosporin 20% outcome with x amount of cost so here if you say the dominant strategy you cannot say a dominant strategy here it is only a cost effectiveness strategy there because you are comparing between atg versus transplant it's very easy to remember that whereas in a myeloma perspective if the outcomes are similar it is a cost benefit analysis in our mind but africanly since it is a medicine we'll have to end up doing uh we we will have to do a cost effectiveness analysis there so i have not done cost effectiveness analysis for that because if you have to suppose we want to set set aside a you know collective decision making and all of us get together put our minds into this we will have to take each stage of the myeloma start treatment how many people go into complete remission how many goes into vgpr how many goes into cr and what is the trajectory of each of those what is the percentage of what is happening to each of those what is the chance of relapse for the each of those and what is the cost incurred for each of these states so short answer as i said right now we are only discussing for myeloma we are not making a menu list but we are in the process at least you should give for a upfront treatment these are the options available choose one of them in a relapse situation these are the options choose one of them so, so you, you know what i feel per personally that when you decrease the efficacy of the treatment with the compromising the cost then the real problem starts with the patient family they want to make up these differences and on actually in the private setup there is actually a real challenge happens so aspiration and the efficacy always don't go hand to hand and the real challenge probably is there so that is a very tricky thing i also don't know what is the right answer to, to that question so here when we don't know the answer the best option is to discuss and give them the option to choose yeah absolutely i agree with you absolutely i agree with you uh i think the era is changing that let them choose the treatment we have to give the options best possible options yeah Uh, yeah, Doctor Dhiraj, please. Yeah, just one minute. Uh, so uh, you, nice you, talk. Uh, Dhiraj, just one minute. So, uh, whenever you have a questions in your mind, you please use the raise hand sign. I will take the questions accordingly. Yeah, please, Dhiraj, go ahead. Yeah, nice talk, uh, Mr. Joseph, sir. Uh, I just want in the same uh, league as Doctor Sanyal has been speaking about. So then, in every discussion, you will have to do audio, video, uh, what you say, recording, and then take consent when you are going to give a menu card. like we are doing in our setup for non routine also for complicated critical care patients but here 
I think you'll have to do that because in our individual practice, we want to give best to the patient. At community level, government level, it's fine. But I think most of us, like uh, private practitioners, so your comments on that is like yeah, everything. Yeah. Now you'll do video records with the family and take the consent yeah. of the members, audio records. Yeah. You know, so we, I don't think video consenting is possible for every disease as much as I'm saying, you know, in a highly litigant community, Northern India, Punjab, etc. We do video consenting as far as possible, but not in myeloma as of now. But we have to mention the options. We write it in the chart and give them a choice to take. Of course, you know, suppose say somebody goes to court and say, why didn't you even tell me about direct tumor I'm upfront? And he takes an expert and says, you should have given diagnosis based on the Casapia trial. You should have done that. Uh, you know, <laughs> then we are in trouble. So it's best to put it in the informed consent. All the options have been discussed. And if you have a card, that is good. If you can give the menu card, uh, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Diraj. Dr. Tulika, please. So first of all, I would like to compliment uh, Joseph. I, I love his talks. Uh, they're always very stimulating and interactive. And uh, uh, he always takes the most complicated topics but manages to make them much more approachable to us. So thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, uh, the uh, question that uh, you had uh, about uh, different types of uh, uh, quality of uh, 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 sorry, uh, different types of cost uh, studies. So they have to be done from the patient's perspective as well as from the provider or the government perspective. And um, you know, one of the difficulties of doing, um, uh, I've kind of thought about this a little and it's very difficult to do uh, studies from the um, provider uh, or government perspective because in government setups, the cost is so subsidized but actually there is a cost. It is not as if the treatment is free in governments. And that is why, uh, uh, you know, when people start comparing private and government, it gives you a very skewed picture because the cost is being given by um, the government. They are providing the electricity, the salaries, the drugs, everything is very subsidized. So in that kind of a setting, how can we kind of come up with the cost uh, in our uh, country? Any ideas? Yeah, so, you know, I have not done that myself, but I've been in discussion with the, I mean, the PGI, some of the groups are doing that. So how that is calculated is basically, first you have to say how many people are involved. So what are the touch points of the patient? So touch point is a consultant, a psychologist, a nurse, etc. How much time is that person giving to them? We have to allocate that time. And then we say, how much is this person's salary is? Suppose somebody takes, I mean, I, I did it, I have done this for our institution. Uh, if you say somebody gets 20,000 rupees as a salary in a month, for example, what is the cost to company by that person's one hour is a question. So you reduce the Sundays from the 365 days, you reduce the annual leave, casual leave, everything, etc. In our institution, one individual works for 222 days. That means half a day Saturday, that is 26 days gone, 252 uh, days Sundays are gone, then annual leave 30 days gone, casual leave 10 days gone, statutory holidays 10 days gone, sick leave 10 days gone. So 135 days almost is not working. Then there's 222 days. So denominator is 222 into 8. The numerator would be 20,000 into 12. And that's about 130 rupees an hour is a cost to company by that individual. That the government is paying. So you say your salary is whatever salary you put on the top in the numerator. Then you say that how much does it cost per minute for that individual? So for a doctor, it may cost, if you're getting two lakhs, uh, three lakhs salary, each minute is 20 rupees worth of the, of the duty hours, right? So there you then take uh, you take up that cost and then you take the cost for the, there is a cost which is in your balance sheet, there will be a cost of the assets and that's a floor space which will be there and from that asset you take the cost for the floor space you use, electricity charges, so it's a long process which you will require basically 
one time effort which has to be done by the institute okay. on the reverse way to say is that if every year the government gives 20000 2000 crores to a particular institute how much of that is going for the salary 80% goes to salary mm -hmm. so therefore you can put 80% of the cost to every service which you add which you have not added i mean that's indirect way of calculating it so basically if you want to do the provider cost and it is not a private sector, that's the this is the actual way to go about collecting that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Dr. Akansha. Dr. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, lecture. And it was definitely an eye opener. So many aspects of cost effectiveness uh, needs to be realized uh, for us as practitioners. So, uh, sir, I would like to ask that uh, with the uh, number of generics that are coming up for all the various drugs, uh, is it possible to do a cost effectiveness analysis between the generics? Because uh, each time, you know, uh, one company comes with a uh, reduced price for a particular drug. But how do we compare these generics and also the efficacy between the generics? So, is it possible to study that? Sure, sir all are possible to be studied. The question is how to go about it. So when you say a generic has been approved by DCGI, that approval is based upon the bioequivalence all the time, not from efficacy perspective. From an efficacy perspective, that is assumed to be the same as the original molecule. Right? Therefore, we... I mean, if you want to do a cost effectiveness, say, for example, you have NATCO versus Intas. I'm just giving you an example. So you, you need to then randomize NATCO versus group, take them through a trial, finish and say, is there any difference between the efficacy and what is the cost incurred for both? Of course, both NATCO and Intas are not going to fund this, obviously, right? Because they there is no interest in that because it is already marketed. You don't need to prove one against the other unless you want to compare it with the original molecule and say this is a non-inferior molecule and therefore I am better off than the rest of the generics and promote me. That's the only intent in which you know, there, are, there are millions and zillions of studies we can do, but we can only do a small proportion of that studies. And then how to interpret is the next thing. It's a big, I mean, if you think of it, the exhaustive way, it's a large amount. So you can do, but we can't do, or we do not have to do. Then you will end up with a cost benefit analysis in terms of both the efficacies are taken as same and you need to do the difference in the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Akansha. Uh, Dr. Sujata. Muted. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah, uh, Dr. Joseph, it was a very extensive study about cost effectiveness. I think we doctors lack in this analysis quite a lot. And then we face a lot of problems. Uh, Dr. Tulika has really raised a question which was uh, in with government institutes where we also face such problems. So what happens mainly patients of the relapse when we have to take a decision about treating them and there are a lot of NGOs who are there to fund for the treatment partly from us like 80% whatever is available from us has to be exhausted plus an NGO. In that condition the decision whether to treat them or not becomes very difficult. So in that case how do we go about it? You know, so you, you, what is the battle there? Is it the cost of the therapy is the problem or it is the... So the, the, the outcome might be only not more than 20 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. And you're going to spend the money of the hospital and an NGO. So, um, I mean, uh, we find it very difficult to take yeah. a decision. Correct. So, so, that, that's, so there you have to play a decision maker there in terms of, uh, say, for example... A relapsed ALL has only 10% to 20% chance of long-term survival. And I have only 10 lakhs with me, whether I can use it in a newly diagnosed ALL or a relapsed ALL. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if the patient cannot fund and you have limited resources, you would rather palliate a relapsed ALL than compromising the treatment for a newly diagnosed ALL, right? Yeah. 
So that's a decision you as a treating physician will have to say. And in our decision also, we can kids, for example, is supporting cancer patients. They will upfront ask what is the outcome expected and then only they decide whether to treat or not. So at least you can make a decision that if a treatment is worthy, I mean, we will try and fund it if there is more than 50 or 60% chance of survival, long-term survival and the cost is less than this. Either or, or both and can be used as your conditional decisions. Yeah, yeah. And one more thing, like uh, in totality, when we talk about the amount of uh, GDP or the uh, amount we are spending on the healthcare, uh, the pa one part is the, the doctors and the second is the drugs, the pharma. The amount of price which they are quoting as an MRP on the on the this versus the amount which the patient gets is a big difference. So as through an NGOs and all, when we are getting, we do compromise on the price. But when they are there admitted in the private hospitals, they are given with an MRP price. So um, anyone who's in, uh, the, he may be insured or not, is spending quite a lot of amount of money in that. So in that, how do we control like in totality? Okay. Tough question. This is linked to business planning. So corporate hospitals would want to keep a drug with larger margins. MRP 1000, landing price 100. Yeah. Like MRP yeah. 1000, landing price 500, both same molecule, different companies. The hospital wants to choose the drug of 100 versus 500 when both the MRPs are the same. Yeah. Now, it's a difference in the hospital policy. That is depending upon what your hospital policy, what your intents are, intention is, how you want to trade off the facilities you are providing. See, basically, somebody has to pay at the end of it, right? If you have a posh yeah. hospital, that has to be paid by the patient. Nobody else can pay for it. So it has yeah. to either come from the drug or from the service charges which is coming. So the only way to do is that get into the policy making and say, we will only take a 20% profit margin. Whatever the landing price is, whatever the MRP is, we will stick to 20% margin, whichever is smaller or the MRP. So that's a decision which has to be done at the pharma, pharmacy drug therapeutic control uh, committee, drug the drugs and therapeutics committee of your institution, of that institution. I think oh. Dr. Sujata, I can answer your question. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I can answer your question. See, look, when uh, you talk about a private hospital setup, yeah. so only income of a private hospital setup is from a patient. But the expenditure verticals are so many. Starting from your medical services department, your marketing department, your nursing, which is a very, very important pillar of our uh, entire treatment. Housekeeping. A good lab technician, in good ECG technician, so customer care officials, so the floor managers, junior resident doctors. There are so many verticals. So I have a long disc. I used to have a long discussion with my FD every time when I, when I run a department now. So these actually these heads are so many. So ultimately, any big infrastructure healthcare like Apollo forties like that their overall margin comes around 8 to 10%, which is not a very, very profitable when you compare the cost and uh, entire costing and then profit you go. So if your hospital is a small size hospital, I'm giving an example, like our Kalan Fortis, which is only 50 meter hospital, their margins are a little bigger, but bigger hospital like Molon branch or something, the profitability margin comes, which is a huge uh, implications of the healthcare. So... Oh, okay. Private setup for private hospital like a, and these hospitals like Apollo 40, they're all listing company. Then every money, and Satish also can comment, I think. The money pal, everything is a listing company. So in the share market, you have to spray your shit like anything is a transparent shit. So managing everything is a, not a matter of joke. It's a huge uh, uh, I think a huge area of the medicine, I guess. So to yeah, add, add, sorry, yeah, so to please, add on please. to your uh, comment there. You know, there is a there is an irony there when you say when you say an government empaneled hospital, we have to treat uh, ESI or a ECHS patient and say charge only CGHS rates. What AIMS and PGI are charging? What they don't take into account is, so for example, CBC normal charges two hundred rupees, 
the CGHS rate is 50 rupees or 40 rupees and you say you must do it. But what is not taken into account is the entire salary of the doctors, which is almost two to three times what, you know, at least CMC is paying, is paid by the government. And then you are saying reagent cost is only 30 rupees and say only 30 rupees. That is not, infrastructure is Something. paid, manpower is paid. And then you say charge only CGHS rate is an unfair bargain. In fact, you should say the private hospital is, if you are treating a government, uh, a ECHS or an ESI patient, they should be paying five to eight times of the what the PGI or CGHS, uh, the CGHS rates are. But unfortunately, the equation is different in the country. And therefore, that is one of the reasons why then private hospitals will have to resort to a margin. This You cannot charge exorbitantly high for a doctor's service, no? So those are, the, those are ethical you know, dilemmas which is there. Obviously, no doctor is, no private hospital is charging more than the MRP. And who put the MRP there is the government. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Dr. Mukur, please. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. That was a great talk. So, uh, regarding the ISA thing, uh, I have a small comment. I'm not very eligible for that either. Uh, how about adding two or, two or three pillars to that? Be it families' aspirations, family or patient aspirations about the disease. Second, being uh, overall prognosis of the patient as assessed by the clinician and uh, thirdly availability of the reimbursement uh, either from the government or through the insurance or whatever may be the means. Yeah, so you know when you say um, evidence to the decision making process, you know Mukul, cost effectiveness is one of the aspects and if you look at that carefully Efficacy is one, cost effectiveness two. Second is, how do I value this? Do I want it? What is my convenience to this intervention? And as you said, what is my family's aspirations are? Do I want to treat an AML in a family where there are three children just barely managing to eat three meals, square meals a day and just about those go to school when you know it's a high-risk AML with a 10% chance, that is a situation when you use a family perspective. In fact, uh, as you said, I would rather use a, one more target in my mind is to say that I may be rich when I am starting to do with AML, but by the time I treat my AML treatment, I'm poor. So you cannot take that into consideration. I mean, what is left behind in my bank matters more than what am I spending now, actually. But that, unfortunately, is not taken into consideration in any of this because I'm looking for somebody to take that into consideration because what is left behind makes more sense than what I have spent now. No? So as you said, there are various other pillars which can be added in the decision-making process. Uh, Dr. Joseph, I have a quick question. So you use a very beautiful sentence, ability to pay and willingness to pay. One of the very famous cardiologists told me once, are doctor patient tumko paisa deta hai kya nahi that is more important patient ke paas paisa hai kya nahi wo important nahi hai so i think it's it's an extremely important thing and we doctors are not the right person to have to understand these things so how you feel the role of the medical social worker coming in the big way in the corporate hospitals trust hospitals even government hospitals and what should be their role defining in this aspect what is your comment really see that is why uh... I, you know, we have a social worker now through CanKids and uh, we are in the process of doing up some of these studies and their role is going to be extremely important uh, in terms of sourcing the incomes and uh, when you said ability to and willingness to pay, who assesses that is the question, right? Uh, in fact, uh, most of the concessions are usually uh, taken by the people who are more educated and have the wherewithal to kind of pretend rather than actually poor people and they actually come and give whatever they have and go. So basically it is very difficult to evaluate the human mind and this uh, behavioral uh, economics will come in there uh, hugely and uh, psychology also will come up play a big role. So of course, as you said, social workers are extremely important. In fact, going forward, that would be one of the reasons why we need to have the social workers to be linked from the beginning itself because over a period of time, they'll be able to assess the 
actual uh, socio-economic background of an individual. Yeah. But a Satish. Yeah. Thanks, Joseph. Enjoyed your talk. Learned a lot. So uh, in your, one of your slides, you beautifully mentioned cost benefit, cost effectiveness, and I think cost utility. Cost benefit and effectiveness is okay, but cost utility, I think it's the biggest challenge uh, for all Absolutely. of us, I believe. So whether you take a plastic, whether you take myeloma, even if it is ITP, whether to give IVIG or not, you know, I mean, it's a very expensive medicine. In heart, you know that maybe with just steroids, it might improve, but the family is so anxious. They want to give IVG. They are asking. Once we say the next thing they say is, uh, we leave it to you. you. I mean, we sometimes we cannot directly ask what is your financial status. If it's an insurance patient, it's okay. If they're paying out of their pocket, we really don't know what is their financial status. We cannot sometimes count in their uh, this thing and say that, okay, go ahead for everyone. And then later they say that we have to sell this and that and do when we know that only steroids could have helped. So I think cost utility is something which I think we need to keep in mind, but it, that is the most important decision. Your comments, uh, John. Yeah. So one is utility in our mind and utility actually evaluated and deciphered. And that is from only 5Q, 5D or uh, uh, visual analog scale VAS, they call and say, it is how much do you attribute? So in the simple answer to your ITP, the discussion is like this. What is the probability of an IC bleed when the platelets are less than 10,000 or 20,000? You have decided to treat because the platelets are less than 30,000. The family is saying that, okay, there is a, well, why, I mean, if the, if see, it's like this, uh, the, the, there is an outcome bias here and the, retrospective bias which is there because they will say that if the outcome is bad they will say you should have used IVIG and if the outcome is good they will not thank you for not using IVIG they would only say you have done what you should have done right yes so the discussion is like this uh, there is a one percent to two percent chance that you can have an IV bleed IC bleed and to the the cost to avoid that one to two percent is going to be two lakhs are you ready to pay for it? So that's the willingness to pay for the 1% risk averted. Correct. For that individual who's ready to, there are patients who have come and said, yes, Dr. Sahib, even if 8% 8 chance, I don't want risk. I want to give the best. Dena hai. I will give IVIG. In my mind, I know that I would have not chosen for myself. But in that particular situation, for that individual, that is the most important thing. And then he has expressed his desire and willingness to pay for it. We cannot be told. It's like this, Dara, should I give upfront or not upfront? Right? I would not insist, but I would not deny. Correct. No, that, that's the difficulty. You're right. Uh, and all of us, yeah. So sure. Joseph, all of us in the last 14, 15 years of practice, you'd have had one patient IC bleed where they died. I mean, the patient of ITP where you see that the steroids does help. I'm sure all of us would have had one or two patients. And then next patients, you know, now... That is the uh, availability bias. Had, that's, yeah. that's called the availability bias. The last <laughs> patient determines your next patient's decision. Absolutely, absolutely. That because you have gone through that uh, difficult time, it's like one aloe transplant died. I don't want to do any more aloe transplant for three more months till I went off this thing. It's like mothers giving birth to a child and say, now no more birth. After <laughs> one year, she's pregnant again. Right, because that no, is there are a lot of biases. I agree. Much so more. that the becomes a little difficult in such patients. I'm saying in such things, a lot of bias. I completely agree. There, I mean, there's doctors bias, patient bias. So many bias comes when we talk about cost utility. I feel. And then that is internet bias. bias. <laughs> internet huh? bias, absolutely. Second, I want to go that uh, it seems uh, everything is being driven ultimately by the patient aspiration rather than anything is the science aside. No, no, no. It is both. No, both. No, Mukul. I can't say you can't say it is patient uh, drives your decision making completely. No. The see, if you didn't have many choices, life was much easier. You know, twenty five years yeah. ago, treating myeloma was very easy. There was only melphalan and prednisolone. There's nothing else. Myeloma, melphalan, myeloma, melphalan, CLI, chlorambucin. Now our confusion has started. Uh, just to... Problem with the aspiration, problem with the aspiration and the pocket size sometimes don't match well. And they are the actual problem. That there are so many information in the everywhere available. What you are talking about, so many treatment options of the CLL, they read and they come. 
it's very difficult sometimes to give them the proper perspective also not easy job yeah that come please yeah so that's where our role as a counselor comes and becomes very very important i believe so uh, we as a counselor have to be very stringent in our decision making but at the same time when uh, placing a whole lot of option to the patients uh, that is also not a very great thing to do at times yes it should be done but not at times so reason being uh, uh, most of the family members patients they are grieved especially at the time of diagnosis and uh, the immediate reaction is to do do anything you want they might be uh, going to an extent uh, to compromise on their finances or other things but uh, initial that time it's like saving the patient at all costs uh, perhaps a more personal involvement like a social worker or a counselor a proper counselor or meeting other patients family members may will be important in such scenarios yeah, sure you know most of the times they come with a, they grade all the treatment options they come with a plan they just want to listen what you are saying so that's doctor that's shopping that's <laughs> that, 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 that's a very common common issue i don't say problem i say a common issue in the practice now in yeah. yeah i think that there is very uh, so many information a one sided so one, you know one patient actually told me uh, doctor why not you are sending me to us because uh, it's okay i can fly to us so हमारा नर्सिस बाद में बताया अरे एक नीटू का पैसा नहीं भरता है ठीक से अभी उसको साहब यूएस भेज रहे हो आप एस्पिरेशन गैप बिटवीन दाइनेंसिस गैप सो एनी मोर क्वेश्चन धीरज यू आर रिलायंस अंबानी एनी कॉमेंट्स so luckily we don't have that much of financial issues but i don't know we were talking of aspirations and everything but uh, still at the back of our mind medical legal issues also come in the mind so we have not discussed that but that also come nowadays when we are treating we think sometimes of course of the patient but also these aspects also it's always there but dr joseph told to discuss all the options tell them all the options and then not just discuss but document 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 yeah document yeah, yeah, yeah. Document. yeah, yeah, yeah. i know satish are very particular about that and let them take a call let them say no for dr agarwal always says let them say no you give the options <laughs> yeah any, so we don't have any questions in the chat box ah uh, any any questions i think dr joseph I have special thanks from the mhg with excellent talk and i have a rare, rare opportunity to listen your last talk also uh that is the whole thing so have a good day to all and thanks uh, our kalpesh bhai and the perfect square and our natco for this beautiful platform to discuss this nice topic so have a good day thanks a lot have a good sunday thank you good day bye, bye.